Top news first and four starts now. Dedicated to Eastern and Southern Kentucky, this is WYMT Mountain News first at four. Good afternoon, I'm Steve Hensley. First at four, the Coast Guard says the Titan submersible likely imploded in the North Atlantic waters and there were no survivors among the five people on board. Officials say the implosion likely occurred near the Titanic shipwreck where the submersible was headed. Now here's a timeline of the search uh, for the last few days. Sunday, the 21 foot deep sea vessel submerged at 8 a.m. Eastern time with five people on board and a 96 hour oxygen supply. The Titan lost contact with its operator an hour and 45 minutes later. Monday, the United States and Canadian Coast Guards conducted surface searches. Tuesday, crews in several aircraft have flown over the North Atlantic Ocean in an area roughly the size of Connecticut. Wednesday at 12.18 a.m. Eastern, the United States Coast Guard announced via Twitter that a Canadian aircraft had detected underwater noises in the search area. Then this morning, the searchers announced that a debris field had been found on the ocean surface near the Titanic wreck site at 3 o'clock. This afternoon, officials announced all five people on board the vessel had likely been lost. A man who was one of the submersible company's first customers has said he felt the dive he undertook was not safe. Arthur Loeb also described the cramped conditions inside the sub and the nerves he felt about the dive being canceled as previous dives had problems with battery issues. There's no seat, you cannot stand, you cannot knee, uh, stand or stay on your knees. You only sit uh, 10 and a half hours in the same situation. Officials say the vessel's 96 hour oxygen supply likely ended early this morning. The FBI is being asked to look into questionable campaign contributions from a Southern Kentucky mayor to the Governor Bashir reelection campaign. It comes after allegations were raised about money from London's newly elected mayor. WYMT's Phil Pendleton has been looking into this and has more from Laurel County. Attorney General Daniel Cameron says since he is a political opponent of the sitting governor in the governor's race, he says that his office ethically is not really allowed to be looking into these questionable campaign contributions. So now he says he's asking the FBI to do that. The Kentucky Lantern first reported that London Mayor Randall Weddle had been linked to more than $200,000 in contributions to the Bashir campaign. The problem is, according to the Kentucky Registry of Election Finance, individuals are limited to $2,100 contributions to individuals' campaigns, $15,000 to political parties. Deputy Attorney General Victor Maddox sent the Louisville FBI field office a letter asking for the investigation due to controlling ethic opinions. Governor Andy Bashir was asked about this today during his Team Kentucky update. Every election I've been in, I have uh, advised and required that my campaign follow the letter and spirit of every campaign finance law. The Kentucky Democratic Party also issued a statement stating that the KDP leadership and staff take state and federal campaign election laws, including finance laws, very seriously. And it further goes on to say that they work with their team, their candidates, and regulators to comply and follow those statutes. Bashir's campaign simply states that these campaign contributions have already or will soon be refunded. In Laurel County, Phil Pendleton, now back to you. We reached out to London Mayor Randall Weddle today about this story specifically, but he has not responded. Daniel Cameron was also asked about this during a campaign stop in western Kentucky, and we hope to have more on that during our 6 o'clock newscast. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul is opening up about a few topics of interest on Capitol Hill. The Hunter Biden plea deal and former President Trump's federal indictment among them. Trump is facing 37 counts in federal court, and as of Wednesday, Hunter Biden is expected to plead guilty on two tax misdemeanors. However, some lawmakers are raising questions, and Senator Paul said in an interview with WYMT today, quote, it's a slap on the wrist. 
it's one of the big things that we fought through the 50s and 60s to make sure that if the color of your skin were darker, that you weren't treated any differently, that this idea of equal protection before the law. If you look at the, um, the whole idea of the classified documents, both Trump and Biden have classified documents. Most people would say they ought to be treated the same. One shouldn't get a punishment and the other not. At 6 o'clock, Senator Paul talks to WIMT's Olivia Calfee about new legislation he co-sponsored to simplify federal disaster applications. Don't adjust your television set. This is not a rerun. It is indeed the second, or actually the first full day of summer. It's the second day of summer overall. We've been inside the summer season for a little more than 24 hours, and it doesn't feel anything like it. Here's the view from Buffalo Mountain here in Perry County. Low gray clouds, temperatures barely making it to 70. Yeah, it's, trust me, I checked the date, I checked the calendar, I checked to make sure this image was moving. It is, in fact, June the 22nd. Temperatures remain in the upper 60s and low 70s. The warm spot in the region right now, or at least in our viewing area, Harlan's at 73. 72 Manchester and Jonesville, everybody else, low 70s, even middle 60s. Look at Williamsburg at 66, Clintwood 66, 67 in Grundy, and 63 in Wise. And you can thank these showers pivoting through the region for that as one of these low pressures continues to spin through the region. Getting a little bit closer, yeah, we're seeing some heavier rain there. Eastern parts of Knox County, heavy rain is a relative term. It's not it, really that heavy, but it's heavier than the showers that surround it. Parts of the Kentucky River Valley seeing showers. Same thing up into the Big Sandy, seeing just more scattered showers. And we'll continue to see this through the evening. Temperatures don't move a whole lot. We go from 70 in the low 70s at best this evening down into the 60s overnight. Steve, I'll have the details on when we see perhaps a bit of a break in the shower activity in a few minutes. All right, thank you very much. Well, in Paris, investigators are combing through the scene of a blast in that city's historic Latin Quarter. This after an explosion ripped through a street which runs from the Notre Dame Cathedral to the Sorbonne University. It hurt at least 37 people, four of whom were fighting for their lives in a hospital. One was still missing this morning. Witnesses described a deafening explosion and a giant fireball that rose several stories high. A Russian court upheld a decision to extend the detention of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. Gershkovich is accused of spying, something he, the Journal, and the United States government all deny. Gershkovich was arrested in March on espionage charges and faces up to 20 years in prison if convicted. The State Department has called the process a sham. Leaders in India say flooding has affected as many as 120,000 people in that country's northeast. That includes 780 towns and villages across 20 districts. So far, no casualties have been reported. Tens of thousands of acres of farmland have also been affected in the mostly agriculture region there. 31 relief camps have been set up in just one section of India. A community in Arizona is mourning the loss of a man killed by a black bear last week. A neighbor shot and killed the bear to try and save him, but it was too late. He's now opening up about his neighbor and the attack to reporter Colleen Sikora. The community here is still grieving this tragedy and grieving the life of Stephen Jackson. And the neighbor who shot the bear says he would do it again. A place of peace. He was looking forward to enjoying the rest of his days in his favorite place in the whole world. Now holding memories of Stephen Jackson. Just such, it's such a loss here for all of us. David Montana was one of Jackson's neighbors, knowing him for a few years as Jackson worked to build a home in Groom Creek. Insanely intelligent. He knew everything about everything. He was just the happiest guy. I mean, he, he it was like he had no problems in the world. He, he just only cared about making people happy and living a great life for himself. And he had that full dream unfolding right, right in front of us. Friday, that dream ended. There's just pounding on the door. He said, a bear Scott Stephen, grab your gun. The Avapai County Sheriff's Office says while at his campsite on his property, Jackson was attacked by a male black bear, unprovoked, as neighbors tried to help. The family has suffered a lot from this, and we were able to meet them and get offer some, uh, some closure in that. Because there is healing, knowing that there were so many people that showed up. 
Ultimately, David stopped the bear. I saw further down the hill, the bear was there and uh, I got his attention and I shot him. And the bear rolled off of Stephen. Um, and I said, I'm gonna shoot again and I shot it again. The bear killed. Montano says his government job gave him training for situations like this. Guns in the right hands. Guns in the right hands with, with proper training and knowing how to do, how to use it. Guns, they, they can absolutely save lives. If that bear had not been put down, who knows who else it could have attacked. And that gives me peace. Peace mixed with grief of a community. We may never know all the details in this, but what I do know is that this mountain is, it is one less person now. In Groom Creek, Colleen Sikora, 12 News. The Arizona Game and Fish said the bear's necropsy found nothing abnormal. The bear was healthy and tested negative for rabies. Coming up on First at Four, hail.